I talk about one of the professors I had in, in seminary quite often. It's the same one. Uh, there was one that really just I connected with. I thought he was a great guy. And I, I had a friend ask me at one point, what's it like to take a class with Dan Dyke? And I don't know if Dan would watch me on Facebook or not. We're, we're friends on Facebook. But if he is, uh, this is the response I gave to my friends. And what's it like to take a class with Dan Dyke? And I said, you, you just really need to be prepared to understand that taking a class with Dan Dyke is like sitting at a water hydrant, a fire hydrant, and you open your mouth as wide as you can and know that you're going to get some in there and some of it you're not. You, know, you just got to gulp as much as you can and know that you're not going to get it all. That's how he is. And today, the, you know, when we approach the book of Acts, the book of Acts is really that way. Each chapter, it's like there's so much there, and you can dive into the depths of it, and you're going to come up back to the surface, and you're going to carry just a, you know, a little bit with you. So today, we're going to continue in Acts chapter 2. We, we did part of that last week and just a little part of it again this week. Uh, but it's kind of like that today. We're going to dig really kind of deep, go down as far as we can go, and, and then we're going to resurface, and I'm going to try to make sense of it all, hopefully, to our context. I want you to imagine w- with me this morning if, if for some reason there was a person that had been living in a cave and didn't know what was going on, and they walked up to you on the street or maybe in the hall at work, and they asked you about the state of our world How would you respond? What are some of the words that you you would use to describe what we are experiencing, not just here in the United States, but what we're experiencing globally? And maybe take just a couple seconds to jot some of those words down that come to your mind. What would they be? How would you describe this place we call Earth? Now I want you to think about that same type of encounter, and this is the question, what is the state of the church, particularly here in the United States? What are the characteristics, what are the words, what are the phrases that you would use to accurately and honestly depict the church? And I want to encourage you to write some of those words down and keep them there in your little word bank and make a distinction between the two. Luke does something very interesting in Acts. I think he he throws a little comparison in there for us. We're tempted to miss it if we read really quickly. But he he throws a little comparison in here in chapter 2 regarding the state of the world and the state of the church at the time period in which he was living and writing. Acts chapter 2, verse 40 says this, with many words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Now, I I, I just want to remind you that I'm putting out these virtual bulletins. So if you're here with us or if you're on Facebook, you can follow the link on the Facebook feed. It'll take you to this virtual bulletin and you'll have some of the text that I'm preaching from today. You can make your own notes. I would highly recommend you take notes as we go along. But here's what he does. He says, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Other translations use the word perverse. The uh, King James Version uses untoward. The English Standard Version uses crooked for the same word that we see in the NIV saying corrupt. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 also uses this same Greek word, but 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 translates it as harsh or unreasonable. The, the word, the Greek word, is the word scolius. And hopefully that sounds familiar to some of you. Scoliosis is kind of a derivative. It literally means crooked or bent. One of the ways the words was used in antiquity was that it was used to describe a piece of wood that was dried out or parched from being in the sun, and it would become warped. A figurative way of understanding this word that Luke uses to describe the world that he lived in would be morally twisted because it was lacking the oil of the Holy Spirit. 
So here's my list of words really quickly from the word study that I did that describes the world, that the state of the world that Luke was living in. Crooked, perverse, corrupt, harsh, unreasonable, and warped. Now, I want you to compare those words to the words that you maybe wrote down or maybe you have them in your head about the state of our world today. How do they compare? Are there some similarities? Are there some differences? Now I want to dig in here a little deeper to what Luke does about the state of the church. Because I think the next few verses, verses 43 that we're going to cover today, verses Let's do 42 through 47. These verses depict the state of the church in which Luke was writing about. He wrote, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking, the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, I want to kind of break this up for you in three simple characteristics we're going to talk about here. And I think Luke highlights this. The first thing we're going to talk about this morning is the early church's devotion. The early church's devotion. Then we're going to go talk about the early church's disciplines. And then we're going to end by talking about the early church's disposition. So three nice D words for you to remember. Devotion, disciplines, and disposition. Now, I want you to recognize something here right off of the bat. In verse 42, Luke says this, they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. Some of your translations may say continually devoted or steadfastly devoted themselves. It's not just a simple devotion that they had, but the word proskartereo means to attend to constantly. To continue to do something with intense effort. So I want you to have that in your frame of mind. They continued to intensely devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. If you skip down to verse 46, you'll find Luke says that every day, or or maybe your translations say daily, daily, a daily engagement. Their devotion was deeper than a one day a week happening. It was something that happened day after day, day by day. And then again in verse 46, when he, you see that word continued, it's the same word used in verse 42, proskartereo, to constantly attend to. So day by day, they constantly attended to meeting together in the temple courts. So we see the devotion of these believers. Now, what Luke is doing here, he's saying all these people that we just talked about last week, the 3,000 souls that were added to the church, this was their devotion to the body of Christ. This is what it looked like to them. When they were baptized into the body of Christ, 3,000 of them, all of them had this type of devotion, this type of, type of consistency, this type of Constancy, this type of intense effort, all 3,000. And then Luke goes on to list their disciplines. He said they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So he lists four right off the bat. Real easy to see those four. And then he goes on to talk about Another that we'll get to in just a second. The first thing he says, now I want you to notice the first thing on the list is, is probably one of the most important things on the list. He says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. How many of you have ever heard somebody say, well, you know, I really just love Jesus, but I really don't study the Bible all that much. It's pretty hard. 
Or, I've heard this, doctrine isn't as important as, important as what we actually do. I've heard that. But first on the list here is the apostles' teachings. The apostles' didache. Didache means doctrine. They devoted themselves constantly with intense effort to the apostles' doctrine, their teachings of Christ, their teachings of the church. So that's a pretty serious one, right? And, and then we have at the end of the list to prayers. Or, or a literal translation is to the prayers. They devoted themselves to the prayers. It's most likely referring to the corporate participatory prayers that they would have recited at the temple. All right, so this isn't an individualized experience of prayer. It's a corporate type of prayer where they're praying the same prayer together. And these, these two things are important, right? We won't argue with doctrine or we shouldn't argue with doctrine and prayer. But sandwiched in the middle of those two biggies, because we still talk about those in the church, Sandwiched in the middle of those two biggies of the apostles' teachings, doctrine, and prayer, we get these two, fellowship and breaking of bread. And they, remember, they're devoted to these things constantly, intense effort to fellowship. That word is koinonia, which literally means partnership, sharing, or communion. And then the breaking of bread. Some scholars would say, well, this is talking distinctly about the Lord's Supper. They're gathering together, and they're partaking of the Lord's Supper together. And I'm not going to disagree. I think that's part of it, but I think it's actually a little bit more broad than that. I think it's actually talking about them sharing meals together, actual food. Uh, if you do some studying, you'll find that in the early church, they celebrated these things called love feast or agape feast. And it was done in memory of the meals that Christ shared with his followers when he would sit around the table and eat intimately with them. And they were devoted to this type of thing in the early church. Fellowship, being with one another, being together in communion, in partnership, sharing, and also sharing food, meals together. It was an intimate thing that they all devoted themselves to constantly. And then down in verse 45, we get the, the next discipline that's very important here to the early church. It's giving. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So there we have five disciplines that they're really devoted to. The apostles' teachings, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayer, and giving. The, the five things that Luke feels is important for us to see. And what you need to understand in this text right here, in these few verses, Luke is setting up. Uh, we could think of it as Luke's thesis statement for what is getting ready to follow in the next uh, around two chapters. So he's setting up his thesis statement. He's painting a picture. This is what you should expect to see playing out in the next few chapters of this book. So he goes into illustration mode next. He says, look, this is what you're going to see, and here's what it looks like in real life. So we have the devotion of the early church, the disciplines of the early church, and now let's talk about the disposition of the early church. One of the things that you cannot escape from seeing when you read these, these verses is that life within the early church was a communal experience. Luke said that all the believers were together, he said every day they continued to meet together. And the phrases that Luke uses to communicate the lifestyle, are, these are just a couple of the phrases, right, that he's using. They weren't, they weren't isolated. They weren't individually seeking after Jesus. They're, they weren't lone ranger followers of Jesus. They were together every day. But notice that they're together in two pretty distinct locations. The communal experience took place in both the temple and in the home. Now, some of you may be saying, now wait a minute. We're talking about the early church here, and they're meeting in the temple. That's the Jewish place. Yeah, that's right. The early church met in the temple. As a matter of fact, they continued to meet in the temple until the Jewish people kicked them out of the temple. And I really believe that if they wouldn't have been kicked out of the temple, they probably would have continued to meet in the temple. Because 
Just because they came to faith in Christ, they didn't throw everything out the window from Jewish tradition. They continued to carry on those traditions and tried to meet the, the expectations of the law. But it's two places where that community is experienced. It's experienced in the temple and in the homes. So the disposition is, we're not doing this by ourselves, we're doing this together. But there's also the disposition that they were glad. Right? He said, they broke bread in their homes and ate with glad and sincere hearts. The word literally means joyful. They met together and they, they ate together and they were joyful. And then this word sincere, maybe some of your trans- translations say simplicity of heart. You know, I, I looked at this and I thought, what? because what? anytime I hear different words with different, different translations, I want to dig deeper and find out, you know, what, what's, the, what's the original word say? What's the closest translation we can get? The original word um, is actually more related to uh, a path. It's talking about a path, but it says an unrocky path. And I found that fascinating. Uh, literally, it means a path without stones, a smooth path. And when I look at that and I look at the context, they broke bread in their homes and they ate together joyfully with smooth hearts not rocky hearts, it paints a picture to me of people that were warm and inviting and welcoming and not cold, not harsh. So we would say it's almost the opposite of the word used for the world. Not corrupt. And then in verse 47 he says, Not only were they glad and had sincere hearts, but they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. They were praising God. That's pretty self-explanatory. They were worshipful. They were extolling his praises. Literally, they were singing his praises as they met together. You can see the picture of joy and warmth and singing. And then they say they were enjoying the favor of all the people. And I think this is important to note here. All the people. It sounds like that Luke is indicating everybody in that area was just overly abundantly happy to have these Christians around. Actually, that's not what that means at all. All the people is a term that is referring to Israel, Jewish people. All the Israelites were happy with the Christians at this point. Not, Not everyone in entirety. So imagine with me the scene that we have here. Just prior to this, Acts chapter 2, everybody's in the city. We talked about this last week. Thousands of people in the city. And there's this crazy event that takes place. There's the sound of a mighty rushing wind. There's tongues of fire that come and sit on each individual. And and people begin to speak in languages. And those in the crowd from different ethnicities, different geographic parts of the world, they hear these individuals who are uneducated speaking in their own language And we have a few different types of people that are gathered there that day. We have people that are seeing what's happening and they're questioning, wow, we hear the the great proclamation you're making. What do we need to do to be saved? And then we had another group of people that were there and they mocked what was going on, right? They said, surely these people are drunk. They're full of wine. Peter says, no, no, it's it's nothing like that. It's too early for people to be drinking. It's not five o'clock yet. So, so we see in that picture that there were some seeds of persecution that had already been sown. There were some people that were mocking those that were actually taking this seriously. So when we get here to this uh, verse that says they had the favor of all the people, it can't mean that every single person that was present was happy with them. But rather the Jewish people at this point still don't have an issue with them. So What you expect here in the next few chapters, don't be surprised when you see these people that were mocking, those types of people become important because they become more intent on persecuting, and the persecution has a result for the church. But I think it's fascinating that in this comparison, Luke, he gives about this much space to the state of the world One verse, 
one word. And when he talks about the state of the church, we have five verses, this much space. I think that's interesting, and that tells me something. That tells me that it's important, as we kind of flesh out what this means for us, that it's important to pay more attention to the state of the church than the state of the world. So here are the results from the state of the church. This is the results that we read about. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Uh, Other translations say through the apostles. I think that's interesting. It's not the apostles doing it. It's God working through them. So there's a sense of awe because there's many wonders, many signs taking place. And then there's this part, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So because the state of the church is as it is, because they have this disposition, this devotion, and this discipline, they are experiencing a mighty move of God. People are in awe, and the, and the text says that the church was, the num- their number was added to daily. Now notice, daily devotion to God yields daily results. If it's been a while since you've seen some daily results from God, you might want to check your devotion to God because daily devotion yields daily results. So here's what Luke is doing. He's saying it is important to recognize the state of the world. It's important to recognize that reality. It's important to acknowledge that reality, but it's not okay to live there. It's more important that we think about and observe and evaluate and analyze the state of the church. You know, one of the things that I've noticed lately in my own life, I'm not going to point my finger at any of you, but surely some of you have done the same thing. One of the things that I've noticed lately in my own life, it's become very tempting to focus on the faults of the world rather than the faithfulness of God and my faithfulness to God. How many of you can find yourself in that spot? It's okay. You can say amen. Amen. It's very tempting to focus on the faults of the world rather than the faithfulness of God and our faithfulness to God. We need to acknowledge those realities that surround us, but we need to focus our attention on how we move forward in this faith journey and in the reality that we live in. So let's talk about this in those three areas, in our, from our devotion, from our disciplines, and from our disposition. The question that we need to ask ourselves is, how much time do we really commit to the church? Now, this is a tricky question. How much time do we really commit to church? And it's tricky because I think it's really easy to get caught up in measuring the wrong data. When we ask this question, what does our commitment look like to the body of Christ, it really goes a lot deeper than talking about butts in the seats and bucks in the bank. It's way more than that. So I I don't want to give you the false impression that just showing up on Sunday either in person or virtually, if you're on Facebook this morning, is the goal of our faith. That's not the goal of our faith. Your attendance on Sunday morning is not the goal of our faith. But our devotion compared to those early believers, if we're really honest about it, is less than desirable. See, their faith was their way of life. It was who they were. It was what they did. Their faith informed their decision-making. Their faith informed their interactions. Their faith informed their schedules. Today, I'm afraid that many of us just try to fit our faith in when our schedule allows. And I'm just as guilty. One of the things we've done is we have developed a box-checking type of faith. We have all of these little boxes of things that are important to us, and as long as we can put a checkbox next to it, a checkmark next to it, we feel like we're living the life that's described in the Bible. If I can just make this check, I've done my duty. We don't spend a whole lot of time with 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 each other outside of Sunday morning. It's the sad reality. We don't. 
I want to consider just for a moment Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25. Now, this is in a section of Hebrews where the writer of Hebrews, um, I'm not sure who that was. So there's a lot of disagreement about it. It's in a section of Hebrews where the writer is talking about the perseverance of people that are experiencing persecution, that are experiencing turmoil because of their faith. And he wrote this, he said, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. You notice that? (laughs) Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and this is the part that I really want to pay attention to, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So, Think about that for just a moment. The picture that we see in Acts that Luke is telling about is that people were daily devoting themselves, day by day by day by day. And then the, the writer of Hebrews says, let's take that a step further, that we should do that all the more as we see the day approaching. Now, what, what day is he talking about? He's talking about the return of Christ. As the, the return of Christ draws nearer and nearer, We should be meeting together more and more. What's what's our devotion? What's the state of the devotion of the church today? Is it, you wrote some words down, hopefully. Are the words that you wrote down similar to the words that Luke used to describe the devotion of the church? Now let's talk about discipline. I, I really... You know, I told Jeff and Shannon before church, you know, last God test me. Last year, before our annual meeting, I preached a toe-stomping sermon. And it's the dumbest thing to do as a minister. You want people to like you before the annual meeting. <laughs> and I was finishing and praying this morning. I said, God, you're doing this to me again. You're giving me this, this tall task. And people can, can literally vote me out the doors today. But... <laughs> I think it's a, it's, it's a test. He's saying, you know, are you going to say it or not? Let's talk about our discipline. I, I read a book about spiritual disciplines once. Uh, the author's last name was Whitney. He uh, said, made this comment, if everybody in America that owned a Bible got them out at the same time and dusted them off, we would have the largest dust storm in history. We chuckle, but the reality is biblical illiteracy is a real thing within the church. I have known church leaders that have made the comment, the Bible says God helps those who help themselves. I said, show me. Where is that in there? If you don't know, it's not. (laughs) According to the Institute for Bible Engagement, the more time, this is interesting to me, the more time we spend relationally with others in the church, the more Bible engagement increases. Now, I don't know why that's shocking because Luke told me that, right, in the few verses that we just read. The more time we spend with each other in the church, the more Bible engagement actually goes up. Recent research has shown, now this is very recent, that Bible engagement has actually decreased during the pandemic because of the decrease in connecting with people. The, 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 the early church was constantly putting forth an effort to understand the doctrine and the teachings of Jesus. Daily, every day. They were constantly meeting together. Fellowship was huge. They're, one of the things we have to understand uh, about this, we've talked about in chapter 1 this idea of witness. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. We, you will be my witnesses. And when we think about the fellowship in the early church, their witness became their witness they were together all of the time in each other's homes and i know this listen please don't take this sermon as he's he's really speaking out against social distancing and mask and 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 i'm not talking about that at all okay i'm not trying to to stir the pot and what i'm saying is even prior to the pandemic, when's the last time you had somebody from the church in your home or when's the last time you were in somebody from the church's home? When's the last time you experienced actual life together with somebody that wasn't part of your family in the church? 
Or when's the last time you just shared a meal with somebody in the church? And this last one really, this idea, this prayer thing, it really bothers me because it hits me in the heart. I set out every year with this grand goal of to be more prayerful, to be more prayerful. You know, and, and by the time the end of the year comes along, I look back at my prayer journal and I man, I was really doing good, really doing good, and then something happens. Right? Because I have the temptation to let my schedule dictate my prayer when in reality, if I would just pray more, my schedule would alleviate itself. So what's what's our state of discipline in the church? And what's our disposition? Here's the thing we have to understand. Our culture is one that prizes individualism and isolation. We, it, it is. We celebrate being different. We celebrate being unique. Our access to social media gives us the false hope of connection, but in reality it keeps us from having true and meaningful relationships, true and meaningful interactions. When you engage in social media, and I know the irony of this is we're broadcasting on Facebook social media, you know, it's easy to type at somebody. It's harder to talk with somebody. We idolize in the United States, we idolize the idea of the Lone Ranger. I mean, how many of you like the Lone Ranger? Hey, it was, it's all right. It's okay to say, yeah, I'm a fan of the Lone Ranger. But th- the problem is we transpose that onto our faith and we want to be Lone Rangers in the faith. But what we see happening biblically is that following Jesus does not happen outside of community. The story of the Bible paints a picture of this being always about community. See, the the fascinating thing is that God called a whole nation, a community of people, Israel. Right, And I said this at our uh, men's fellowship breakfast on Saturday mornings at Bryan. And the Bible tells us that when he comes, when Jesus comes back, guess what? He's not coming back for an individual. He's coming back for the church community we've diminished the value of the intimate settings of meals together and experiencing true fellowship while we've elevated the large group setting did you catch what I said we've diminished the value of the small intimate settings and elevated the value of the large group setting and Luke says that both are important The, this text shows us the necessity of gathering corporately in a large group, but it also shows us the importance of gathering in small groups. Skip Heitzig said this uh, concerning this concept. He said that in the large group, we experience God as most high. When we gather in the small setting, we experience God as nigh, being close. See, here's the, the reality. Healthy churches are composed of rows and circles. These are the rows. This is the large gathering. The circles are the small groups when you all sit around and you learn about one another and you have a voice. In this setting today, I'm the only one that has a voice and you sit there and hear. But in the small setting, everybody has a voice. It's important. And all of these things are easy to accomplish when we're simply willing to be with our brothers and sisters when we're willing to allow our witness to become our witness. So, let me ask again. Think about your list. The words that you use to categorize the world, to describe the world, the state of the world, and how closely are they related to Luke's description of corruption warped, perverse. When I did this myself, I'd tell you that the words that I was using to describe the world fall into the category that Luke used. The world today is no different than it was in the context in which which Luke was writing. At the very core of what the world is, it's the exact same. It's corrupt, it's perverse, it's warped, it's cursed. The problem... (laughs) is that I believe if we're honest, 
the words that we use to describe the church today are not the same that are used to describe the church in Acts. That's the problem. So it creates a gap. A gap between what we know and what we actually do. So here's the teaser in the commercial. If you want to find out how to close the gap, you've got to keep coming back because as the book unfolds, that's what Luke does. <laughs> to be continued. Listen, I have, uh, the, the time in which we are living is very unique for the church. This idea of different, we're going to come back to this and I'm going to be done. This idea of different types of people that gather that we see in Acts. I talked about this at the beginning. You're going to have the skeptics, you're going to have those that buy in, and you're going to have those that just show up. All right, they just show up to see what's going on. We have an opportunity right now as followers of Christ to demonstrate something that this world is desperately lacking. Authentic love, authentic relationships, authentic togetherness, but this is what it takes. You see my kids play sports. Abby's actually playing volleyball right now. And I know you're going to say, Sean, we talked about this schedule problem. It's, a, it's real. But here, here's the thing. My kids play sports, and something hit me yesterday. Matthew is playing dirt road basketball, and I don't, I'm not coaching. I'm just a parent. I've always kind of coached up to this point. So as I was sitting there watching Matthew play basketball yesterday, I was jumping up and down and screaming and yelling. I'm going to brag on him. He was the only little boy that made a point for his whole team yesterday. They didn't get shut out, thanks to Matthew. <laughs> but something hit me. You know, when I was coaching and when I was playing, I was making an impact. As a fan... It's easy for me to sit there and say, Matthew, you should have done this. <laughs> Matthew, you know, you could go to the left a little bit more. But if I don't get hands-on, all right, it doesn't make a big difference. Kyle Eidelman wrote a book called Not a Fan. He talks about fans versus followers. The state of the church today is that we're full of a bunch of spectators, we got a bunch of fans that come and sit in the stands and they'll raise their hands and clap when things go good. They'll be disappointed when things go bad. But what we see in the early church is there weren't any fans. There were followers. There were people that got in the game, got their hands dirty. It became who they were. That's the opportunity we have. We have the opportunity to get off the bleachers and get on the field or the court. And that's the invitation that God's leaving every one of us this morning. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for being who you are, for your love and your mercy and compassion. And God, I'm thankful that when we do fall short, you offer forgiveness and your grace is new every morning. I hope I'm not the only person in here this morning that's felt convicted by your word. But I hope that I, I'm not the only person that understands that when I feel that conviction and when I come to you with a repentant heart, you freely forgive. God, my prayer is that you would allow us to be filled so full to the top of your Holy Spirit that we can't any longer sit on the bench. that we would be willing to get out on the court, on the field, and, and to put our hands to work to say what needs to be said and to serve the way that we need to serve. Father, I know that you tell us that there are times that are coming that we're going to be persecuted, that our way of life is going to be under scrutiny, and in those moments we will need each other more than ever. Help us to see that now and to put that into place and practice now before it becomes scramble time. 
But God, in all of our attempts and our efforts to live this type of life that Luke is talking about, may it never become about our glory and our accomplishments. May it always be about who you are and what you're doing for humanity. And I pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. As they come up here to sing this last song, I just want to encourage you to sit there in your seat and to reflect on what you've heard this morning, not from me, but think about what God has spoken to you through his word, how he's challenging you, how he's comforting you. And if you're one of those people that struggles with hearing the voice of God, just ask him to speak to you. And once you ask him to speak, be quiet enough to hear his voice.